read in Genesis chapter 19. And in the background to this is the story of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities that were marked by sin, and cities that because of the depth of their sin that they, that, 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 that they were involved in, that they were engaged in, God had vowed that he was going to judge them. And God had passed judgment that he was going to destroy these cities. And, and there was a godly man by the name of Abraham, and he prayed over those cities, and he asked God to be gracious. He asked God to be kind. And he prayed to God, and he said, look, God, if you find 50 people in those cities, don't destroy them. And God said to him, he says, look, if I find 50 people in those cities, I won't destroy them. And then, and then Abraham goes back and he says, see if you just find 40, will you not destroy them? And God says, if I find 40 people, I won't destroy them. And then he says, what about 30 and 20? What, what if I even find 10 people in that city that are righteous? God says, if there's 10 righteous people in that city, I won't destroy it. You know, the sad reality is this, that as God looked over those cities, God could even find 10 people that were righteous. And so God is going to have to pass judgment on them. God is going to have to destroy them. But this man, Abraham, that had been praying, had family there. And so he goes and he warns them. And, and, and Lot and his wife and his children are warned. And as the warning about God's judgment comes, we read in verse 14 that Lot went out and he spoke to his sons-in-law, those that had married his daughters, and he said, get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, it seemed like he was just joking. Just joking. To them, it was just a joke. The fact that God was going to pass judgment, the fact that God was going to bring judgment into, uh, into Sodom and Gomorrah, and it was just a joke. You know, the sad reality is the hearts of men have never really changed, have they? Because we live in a wicked generation. We've been thinking of sin this afternoon already. We've been thinking of the fact that every single one of us has fallen short of God's standard. Every single one of us has broken God's law. Every one of us stands before a holy God guilty. And God has passed judgment. God has passed judgment on every single one of our lives because of our sin. And the sad reality is this, that we're just like those men, Lot's son-in-laws, and we just say it as if it's a joke. And we refer to the wrath of God and the judgment of God as if it's something to be mocked at and something to be laughed at. It's a reality. It's a reality that this world is hastening towards quicker than we would like to believe this afternoon. The judgment of God... Scripture reminds us, doesn't it? It says it's appointed unto men once to die and after this judgment. And so there's judgment for our sin. And we need to be serious about it. It's not something to joke about. When we take, talk and make reference to places like hell and the lake of fire, you know, people seem to have this kind of idea that, that all of that's just something to be joked about and laughed at. That when we eventually get there, we're going to be there with all our friends and we're going to have a great time and, and hell is going to be one big long party for all of eternity. The Bible gives us a description of hell. The Bible says that hell is a place of torment. The Bible gives us insight into the life of someone who found himself there. And do you know what his greatest wish was? His greatest wish is that no one else would join him. Send someone back to warn my family. He says, because this place I'm in is a place of torment. Looking just for a, a drop of water to quench his tongue. It's a reality. It's not something to be mocked at. It's not something to be ridiculed. It's not something to think flippantly about. And so Lot goes out and he warns them and they just think it's a joke. And Lot takes his wife and he takes his daughters. And unless they're going to be consumed, he takes them out of the city and it says, while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them out that they said, escape for your life. Don't look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. And in verse 20, we read these sad words. But his wife, that's Lot's wife, looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. The warning had gone out, escape the judgment of God. Salvation has been provided. There's a means of escape. The warning has gone out. Judgment is coming. 
Make sure that you escape the judgment of God. And don't look back. Don't look back. And Lot's wife, tragically, looks back, possibly looking back lingeringly, lovingly, to that which was being destroyed because of its sin. And God destroyed her. God moved in judgment. And the tragedy of Lot is this, Lot's wife is this, that she was, she was so close to salvation. She was so close to salvation. And she perished. She perished. You know, that's the burden that I've got with you this afternoon is these individuals that we're looking at, these are individuals who were so close, so close, and yet they were lost. And she knew the judgment of God was coming. She knew that sin had to be dealt with. She knew that God was righteous. She knew that God was faithful to his word. And yet she did exactly what God had asked her not to do. She turned back. She perished. And she was almost saved. Almost saved, but lost. And do you know what I fear sometimes is with individuals that just come in, out, come in and out of our, our services and our family service and, and listen to the messages week on and week out and hear messages about the need to be saved and hear messages about the fact that you're sinners and, and that your sin deserves God's judgment and, and hear messages about a way of salvation that has been provided in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. And perhaps you have got to the stage when you could literally relay the gospel message for yourself and you could share it with other people and you could tell other people about what you've heard and what you've listened to and maybe even quote Bible verses and all of these things. And yet the danger is this this afternoon, that you are so close, so close, just as Lot's wife was so close, and yet you'll be lost. You'll be lost. And that's what makes my responsibility this afternoon so grave to think that I'm speaking to individuals who could find themselves on the wrong side of eternity, lost forever. And you've been so close to it, so close to salvation. You've heard about your sin. And surely there's none of us in the room this afternoon that can deny it. As we look into our own hearts, surely our verdict has to be the same verdict that God gives concerning us, that our hearts are, are, are desperately wicked, that we're sinners. And as we look into society, surely we must acknowledge that we live in a society of people that are marked by sin. And as we look at the world we live in and its brokenness and its shame, Surely we have to come to the conclusion that God is right and that every single one of us has fallen short of God's perfect standard and we're sinners and because of our sin then we deserve God's judgment. Surely in order for God to be a righteous God then he has to judge evil. God is not just going to merely sweep our sin away and kid on that we haven't committed it. God is of holy rise and to behold iniquity. God is too holy to just ignore the fact that we're sinners. God has to judge our sin. And yet the God who has to judge our sin is a God who has made a means of salvation whereby our sin can be judged and we can be forgiven. And that was through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you know you're a sinner this afternoon. You acknowledge that you're a sinner. You acknowledge that there's a saviour that has been provided in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God in his grace and God in his mercy has provided that for you. And you know, you know like Lot's wife knew, judgment was coming. And you know like Lot's wife knew that there was salvation possible. And yet she was lost, so close so close and yet lost. And the reality is this, that you might be here this afternoon and you're so close. You may be so close now or maybe you look back to a time in the past when you were so close to salvation 
so close to accepting Jesus Christ as your saviour, so close to availing yourself of the work that the Lord Jesus Christ had done on the cross. And the sad reality is you could have been that close and you could be lost and lost forever. Remember, Luke will write, remember Lot's wife. Don't let the memory of Lot's wife be lost on you because there was a woman who had every opportunity to be saved, who had every opportunity to escape the wrath of God for her sin. She never took it. She was lost. So close. So close. And yet lost. We turn over into Luke chapter 18. We're reminded of another young man, and he was close. He's described as a rich young ruler. We won't go into too much detail about him, but he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ with a question. He says, look, he says, good master, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and here's a man, and, and, and he's got some recognition of who Jesus is. And he's got some recognition that Jesus might just have the answer. And he asks a question, uh, appreciating that, that life did actually go beyond the here and now, and life did go into eternity. What must I do to inherit eternal life? How do I get it? And he comes with the right questions, and, and he even comes to the right person. Comes to Jesus. And you think to yourself, well, surely if, if anyone's going to get salvation, if anyone is going to be the recipient of eternal life, then surely it's going to be somebody that's coming to the right person and coming and asking the right questions. And yet Jesus responds to him, doesn't he? And Jesus says, you know the commandments. And he starts to lay, lay them out for him. And, and, uh, and he says, I've kept all the commandments. I've been a good person. I've lived a good life. I've not been guilty of breaking any of the commandments. And Jesus says, but one thing you're lacking. Go and sell what you've got, he says, and come follow me. And it says these sad words in Luke chapter 18 that says that he went away sorrowful because he was very rich. And somebody that was so close somebody that found himself in conversation with Jesus Christ, somebody who, who appreciated that there was life beyond human life, that there was eternal life, somebody that recognised and realised that, that, that the answer to that might be found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet when the cost of it, when the cost of being a follower of Jesus was impressed on him. The cost was too high. And he walks away from Jesus. And he walks away from eternal life. And he's lost. And he was so close. I suppose there's a sense in which we could put it into today's terms. He had sat. He sat under the teaching of God's word. He'd listened to what God had to say. He had an appreciation that there was a need in his heart that, that wasn't going to be fulfilled anywhere else. And he had all of that. He had all of that and he was lost. Lost. And you sit here week in and week out, and month in and month out, and some of you is year in and year out, and you listen, you listen, you listen. And maybe there's something within your heart because at the end of the day, why do you come and and the rest of walk and leg don't come. Why do you find yourself here when, when no one else seems to be interested in hearing about Jesus and about eternal life and about hearing from God's word? Because God is working in your heart. God is trying to draw you to himself. God is trying to open your eyes to the truth. And you sit week in, week in, week out, month in, month out, Year in, year out, some of you have been coming. And the sad reality is this. You could still be lost. You could have been so close and get lost. And that's tragic. There are people in our world today and they've never heard about Jesus. And they've never heard about their need for a saviour. And they don't know what sin is. And they don't know that there's a hell that waits them. And they've never had the privilege of having a Bible opened and explained to them. 
And you get it every week, sometimes more than once a week, some of you. And the reality is this, that you could still be lost. Lot's wife knew. She was so close. She was lost. And the rich young ruler knew he comes to the Lord Jesus. And the cost of discipleship is placed on him. And he decides that the cost is too much. And he's lost. There is a cost to following Jesus. But it's nothing compared to what you lose or if you don't follow. Think of all you've got to lose this afternoon. You know, we, when we have meetings like this and when you're contemplating things like this, do you know what you think? You think about all that you're going to lose if you become a follower of Jesus. How about thinking about this this afternoon? Think of all you're going to lose if you don't become a follower of Jesus. <laughs> what does Scripture say? Scripture says this, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What does it profit someone if they gain the whole world? If that were even possible, to gain the whole world and lose your own soul. What are you got to lose if you don't trust Jesus this afternoon? You've got to lose everything. Your precious, eternal, never dying soul could be lost forever. And as a young man, and he's in hell this afternoon, and he was so close, but the cost was too much for him. He wasn't willing to pay it, and he walked away from Jesus. And he was so close and he's lost. And in Acts chapter 26, we're introduced to another man. and He's presented with the gospel that you've been presented with. Not only in, 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 in word form, but he's been presented with it in the life of someone that stood before him. Someone whose life had so been dramatically changed by the power of the gospel. Whose life had been transformed by Jesus on the Damascus Road. Saul of Tarsus had that experience when he'd been out persecuting Christians and making it his, his, his aim to destroy the Christian church. And he was getting Christians to blaspheme the name of Jesus and he was putting Christians into prison and he was giving consent when Christians were put to death. And he's going to Damascus to do that. And on the road to Damascus, Jesus Christ intervenes and that great light shines. And, and, and he falls down and he says, who are you, Lord? And the response comes, he says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And there, on the Damascus Road, Saul of Tarsus, his life was transformed instantaneously. And he who had persecuted the church became someone that would tend the church, who would feed the church, who would protect the church, who would give his life for the church. And he stands before Agrippa, this king, and he presents to him the glorious person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he presents to him the fact that he has experienced Jesus for himself. And he has known Jesus' power in his life. How Jesus had taken him from someone that would, that would cause Christians to blaspheme the name of Jesus to someone who would preach the name of Jesus. Not just to the Jews, but he would go to the Gentiles. And he'd be responsible for taking the gospel into our world. And he stands before a grip and he presents Jesus as the only saviour. And, and, and Agrippa listens to the message. And he, and he listens intently. And he listens with intelligence. And then he says these words at the end of Paul's little message to him. He says, Paul, you all must persuade me to be a Christian. You all must persuade me to be a Christian. And Paul says, oh, he says, oh, that you wouldn't just be almost, but you would be all together. You and everyone else who's listening, you would be all together. Christians, you would all together put your faith and trust in Jesus. And the only way I would want you to be different from me is that you wouldn't experience the bonds of imprisonment that I know. He says, oh, that you weren't just, that you weren't just almost, but you were all together, all together for Christ. He says, you almost persuade me. And maybe you've sat in these seats. And maybe that's what you felt. Maybe you felt, you know what, that preacher's just almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Almost. And the Spirit of God works in your heart. And it is the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God challenges you. And you've had that same response. I'm almost, almost willing to be a Christian. You know, we never ever read of Agrippa becoming a Christian. 
you know, maybe by God's grace he did, but it's not recorded for us in Scripture. As far as we know, he never became a Christian, but he was almost there. In the presence of Paul, as Jesus was presented as the only saviour of the world, he was almost persuaded. And I read a little thing the other day and it said this, to be almost persuaded is to be almost saved. And to be almost saved is to be entirely lost. I wonder this afternoon, is there individuals in the room that I'm preaching to or people that are listening along online and you're almost saved? As things stand currently, you're entirely lost. And you run the risk of being entirely lost for all eternity. So close. And yet so far away. You know, think wisely this afternoon. Think long and hard about, about the message that we present. Think long and hard about your need for a saviour. Think long and hard about the saviour that has been provided in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acknowledge that you need him and that without him, you will be lost. You'll be lost forever. But this afternoon, there is hope. There is hope for you this afternoon. You can experience God's salvation now in the seat that you sit in. Between you and God, you don't even need to engage with any of the rest of us. You don't need to talk to me. You don't need to talk to anyone else. Before you and God, God is inviting you to come. He said, didn't he? The Lord Jesus Christ, he said, he says, I am come to seek and to save those who are lost. And if we're lost this afternoon, it doesn't matter how close you are or how far away you are, we're lost, then there's a saviour that's come to save us. And we need to put our faith and trust in him. And we need to bow before him and we need to acknowledge our sin and we need to acknowledge our need of him and that without him we will be lost and will remain lost forever. But because of him and because of what he has done and because of the death that he has died and because of the sacrifice that he has made, salvation is possible for you and I today. And so the question is this, don't just be almost but be all together. Commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can hands down say, and others in the room will join me and say it will be the best decision that you will ever make if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, shall we? Father, we just come before you and we just come humbly in the name of the Lord Jesus and we